okay, let's talk about uh, humans and how amazing we are. We're going to talk about conservation and change. So technically, we already dealt with the study guide, so that's a, that's a big fat you uh, done. Yeah. Our objectives, it's a big list. So before we get there, for the, your lab, that's that due yesterday. But if you had issues, I haven't scored them yet, so you could resubmit, whatever. I don't remember who emailed me. One of you emailed me asking about if you need, like, there's like five different spots, or you had five different pages for species, but what if you only observe two species? Did I have to fill in the pages for the other three? And the answer is no. If you only saw two, you saw two. You just move on. So you do not need to have the thing filled out to the max. You saw what you saw. We can't force you to write in more if you didn't see it. It's the thing about ecology. It's If it's not there, what am I going to do about it? I can't force things to suddenly exist that aren't there. So if any of you were like, oh, I made stuff up. Well, if you want to like delete it, then resubmit it. Okay, did you do that? Or just leave it there and hope that I don't sit there and say, I think you made this up. Like, whatever. I, that was me being something dumb from two weeks ago. That's why I'm like, okay, I need to figure out how I'm going to score this thing. But yeah, that, that's just me being stupid. My problem to solve, and I'm not sure how I'm going to solve it. Yes, okay. this is the last thing that's fair game on the test. Because it's a week out. So if we had a lecture on Thursday, it would not be on the test. So let's sugarcoat this. Humans are a threat. One of the things that we worry about when we say we're a threat is there's a loss of biodiversity. So the problem is we need to define the term biodiversity. We've made reference to it earlier with something called the Shannon Index. That was H is the sum of the proportion of that species times the natural log of that species proportion. And you just add all those up. The field trip this upcoming Saturday at 10 a.m., this is what we're going to calculate. So this is what we're actually going to be doing, is calculating the diversity index. The problem is the Shannon diversity index only applies to what we call species diversity. But there are other versions of biodiversity that we are fully aware of. One of them is genetic. That's when we look at gene pools and allele options. We could also look at ecosystems. So where we look at the health, spread, and the variety of ecosystems. All of that deals with biology, so it's all describing biodiversity. Even though we like to only think about that in terms of what's going on with species, but genetic variation is just as important. Variety of ecosystems is just as important.
one of the things about us humans is we like predictions. You know, we like to be able to look at something and figure out what the next step will be. So the result of this little phenomenon of us is we like to be an ecosystem engineer. We've dealt with that one before, that we're ecosystem engineers. But what we do with this is we typically make everything uniform. So if we were to pick on the American diet, and only the American diet, what do Americans eat? Hamburgers, so a moo cow, a pig, a chicken. We don't really eat fish. We don't really eat turkey. We pretend every, like, once a year. Then beyond that, it's... Wheat, corn, rice, potatoes. <laughs> like, seriously, are you now not like Brussels sprouts, please? That's green. We don't eat that. But are you noticing, like, suddenly it's like, wait, well, crap, what, what, what do we eat? Like, the list got really short. Sugar beets. We eat sugar beets because we like our sugar. This list isn't that big. Well, what variety of foods are there to eat? We can't name them even if we knew them all. We don't have time. There's unfathomable amounts of things that we could be eating, and we elect to say... Yep, I like the same eight things. So in doing that, how do you only reproduce and grow these eight things? By eliminating that. You need to take out the ecosystem so that you can grow your corn, so that you can feed it to your pigs, so you can eat the pig that ate the corn on a field that used to actually be five or six different ecosystems. We eliminate things so that we can have uniformity. Of course, the irony of it all is it's diversity that helps us. You may apply that to whatever type of political situation you wish. I don't think it's on the next slide. It's not. But what can I mean by this? Where do we get our medicines? We get them from drugs. Where do we get them from the drugs? From the pharmacists who are and the engine and the chemical engineers who design them. And where do they get their inspiration? Plants where? In rainforests. We eliminate the rainforest, we eliminate our options for medicines. Because we're not creative enough. But plants are. Insert irony there, with us liking to think that we're all that. So where do we look if we want to find biodiversity? There are some patterns that we can look for. One of those patterns is if I look at latitude, what I typically see, everything's falling asleep today, is on a globe, biodiversity increases the closer we get to the equator. So the closer we're at zero, the more biodiversity we have. Here's a fun one. Where we have... More evapotranspiration. So it's hot, and we have trees 
going through transpiration, we tend to have more biodiversity. Well, where do we find this? Somewhere between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south is typically where we'll find this quite often. Which is a nice way of saying, in the middle. We need there to be lots of precipitation. Well, here we actually get more varieties. But we need some type of area where we get lots of precipitation. So we're not talking deserts, predominantly. Depending on where the chaparral is, you might. Depending on where the savanna is, you might. It helps if we get stable temperatures. Stable temperatures typically make it a little bit easier. Last one listed here, which are area effects. If you increase the area, you increase the diversity. Because we are reducing density dependent factors. We are reducing competition, especially the interspecies competition. The more space you have, the more area you have to find niches and eventually evolve to either fit or die off. Get more niches. This is good for diversity. All right, I could buy that for a dollar. Bigger islands, more diversity. Smaller islands, less diversity. Okay, got it. There's a mosquito that, it's been here a while, but people are starting to talk about it again. Of the 80s genus. You know these as the ankle biter mosquitoes. So these are the suckers that when you look at their legs, they have stripes on their legs. So they're wearing stockings. These ones hunt during the day. They go knee and below. They also tend to have multiple bites. Why do we care about multiple bites? Disease transmission requires multiple bites. These are the mosquitoes that once they're given the right environment will bring us malaria. And we could ask back east, how that's going for them. How'd they get here? Which people? How? We know this one. We actually know this answer as to how these ones showed up. Did I do something stupid? I know a lot of you have been giggling. Did I do something weird? Oh, okay. I was just curious, like, wait, did I write something dumb? What did I do? <laughs> These came over on a tanker. One of the, you know, the big boats where they carry out, where you see all the big cargo holds that they put onto it, where, you know, they bring the canister off and then, like, oh, look, it's Christmas time. They dump all the presents out. It came from Japan. And someone wasn't paying attention, and there was some plant material with some standing water. And we've had it since 2002 here. We brought it to us. So that's fun. It hasn't brought any of its fun relatives with it, but we're setting it up for the disease to start to, or diseases to start to spread. Um, if we introduce 
pathogens into areas, typically we get a naive population, meaning they have no evolved ability to fight it off. These are pine trees. If you don't know, because you don't like to draw, or if you do like to draw and you don't know this little bit, then you're going to learn something. Because it's almost Christmas time, because like it's four months away or something like that. If you draw your Christmas tree like this, you have a dead tree. What? But it's green. Dead needles point down. Living needles point out. What type of tree are these? We call these conifers. If you wanted to look at conifers, where would you go? Sierra Nevadas, they're all over the bloody place. I go to a cabin with friends from college. We've done this for like 20 some odd years. It's one of those like, why are we still doing this? We're all in our 40s, this is weird. This is an aerial shot from the forest around the cabin. If you see brown needles, especially brown needles at the top of a tree, it's a dead tree. Brown at the bottom is normal. Brown at the top is it's dead. What's the cause of this? Something called the bark beetle. The result of this beetle, which feeds off of phloem sap, we'll talk about that one in a few weeks, is it's actually depriving the trees of their ability to fight off other pathogens. It's weakening them because they don't get as many nutrients as they normally should get. And the result of that is they become very susceptible to drought. There's a relative of some of these that we are also worrying about with these bark beetles. They're called the sequoia and the redwoods, which are kind of like California of like model organisms of what people think of with when they think of our state. We brought the larvae over from I don't remember which country. We brought them over like two decades ago. Didn't realize realize it person visited the area where these plants live and killing them ever since the plants have no ability to fight off and kill this bark beetle but if you were to go and wherever these beetles come from they don't kill off the trees because the trees can poison the beetle our trees don't know what this beetle is we have no defense y'all know this fun ter term zoonotic transfer For ye future doctors, you want to know this one. Zoonotic means from animals. So this is when you get something like a virus or a bacterium from a non-human animal. <coughs> Most famous example of it? It didn't start out as a human virus. Even if you want to say that it was made in a lab, which... But it had to come from somewhere first. <clears throat> We're worried about an H5N2 outbreak, I believe, which is a avian flu. Why are we worrying about it? It's a bird flu. Because we are around birds a lot. <clears throat> Do any of you have bird feeders at your house? If you did, you would need to be careful when you're changing out the bird feeder. Because if you don't wash your hands before and after, you just touching where the birds are could be enough to transfer a bird flu to you, and you 
could spark a new outbreak. That'd be fun. What's smallpox? You would say, I don't know what smallpox are. That seems a little mean, but okay. The reason why you don't know what smallpox is, is because I've never had to worry about it, and I'm older than all of you, which means you've never had to worry about it. We have eliminated, on purpose, one virus from the face of the earth. Only one. This is back when we could pretend to like each other. This is the virus we eliminated. It was smallpox. If you would like to give yourself some light pictures to make you say, ah, oh, yes, now I can dream off to sleep, look up what smallpox does to you. Look at what it does to you if you survive smallpox and how it disfigures your face. It's fun. Why is it called smallpox? Because the bubbles are smaller than the big poxes that you get. And what is the big pox or the great pox? Syphilis. That one you probably heard of. I'm probably willing to wager you've heard of syphilis. We can't get smallpox before because we actually put forth an effort to stop stuff. Kind of like how we also put forth efforts to spread things. Um... Sometimes we don't spread pathogens. We just, you know, we just do our thing. So the Brazilian election was a big deal. The fact that they did not reelect their right wing uh, president, whether right wing, left wing is one thing or not, you know, whatever to that. But one of the things that their former president was very big on was there's no reason to keep the Amazon. We need to burn it down and turn it into housing and farms. We can ignore what diseases are waiting for you when you enter into that area. I'm not going to volunteer to buy my first house in that spot. But that loss of habitat always will result in a loss of genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. It's an automatic loss. But also because you're moving into there, you're going to bring new species with you that you didn't intend to bring. Or you might bring something out of there that you did not intend. I mean, I know it's a sci-fi movie, but did you all see the movie called Life? Okay, so here's a new one, you know, to make you sleep well at night. You want to look up a movie called Life. If my memory serves, it has Jake Gyllenhaal in it. Who else does it have? I can recognize him because he's in all sorts of great movies. I have no clue what his name is. Did any of you watch John Wick uh, 4? Okay, so for the good people in the room who watched John Wick 4... You had the, to the uh, Osaka Continental. He was the manager. He's like the last person you see in this movie. Where it's, it's not good. If you watch, if you use TikTok, you've probably seen movie clips from life floating around. It's all mostly in space. And it involves, we found life somewhere else. Is that good? Introducing species is not necessarily a smart move. This plant here, it's called kudzu. It's a Japanese ivy that we have no clue how to kill. Someone was in Japan and said, that plant's so pretty. It would be so beautiful on my house. And they brought it over. And you know what? It was pretty on the house until it grew over the house, took over the yard, and then started growing into other people's yards. And literally in the Midwest, it's an epidemic of this one plant. 
that they cannot kill. It is everywhere. And it's because someone said, so pretty on my brick wall. So nice. Obviously, we cause trouble by over-harvesting. We don't need to talk about what we've done to the fish. Can't, which country was it? Iceland? Greenland? One of the two just started whaling again. It's like, what? What do you mean whaling? Like, oh, look, it's a whale. I'm Ahab. Ah, spear. Kill whale. People still do that? Oh, Japan's never stopped. I'm part Japanese. I'm ragging on my own people. Okay. Industry, obviously. Have you all ever seen a strip mine? You need to do yourself a favor if you, because uh, I know a few of you wish to do environmental stuff. Do yourself a straight favor. You need to go to a town called Boron, California. It's off the 58. You're going to be in the middle of nowhere. Hope you have gas. Because you're going to be convinced if you uh, lose your ability to drive your car out there, you're going to die. And the answer is no, but maybe. It's a big old strip mine. A big old open pit. And you're like, oh, but they're not that big. Okay. Go drive out there and visit. They're actually famous for isolating the element boron out there. Boron is element number five on the periodic table. It's used in an industrial product. Yes, borax, which is a cleaner. Uh, don't care. Uh, don't care. Okay. Okay, so what are we doing to populations? One of the things that we're doing is we know you can choose to blame or not blame us. That, that's a different story. But the term extinction has been floated with humans quite a bit. So what's an extinction? Permanent loss. Of that species and its genetic material from the gene pool. It's gone. It's no longer an option. One of the things that people have asked about for a while is, if it's possible to de-extinct something. This is an article from last year. There's a company that wishes to resurrect the thylacine, which is the Tasmanian tiger. Were they tigers? No, they're kind of like a bigger coyote, but it's a Tasmanian version, so it's a marsupial. They were hunted to extinction because the farmers in Tasmania and the southern portions of Australia were convinced that the Tasmanian tigers were eating their invasive sheep. And how dare these things that lived here first were eating our sheep that we brought over so that we could have sheep. There was no evidence, still no evidence, that they were actually eating the sheep but they still killed them all anyway. There's a very sad video that you've probably seen online of the last Tasmanian tiger that we knew of, where it's just like pacing back and forth in a, in a zoo cell. Sale. Zoo cell. It was, it's, it was black and white, but they did a false color of it. There are people who are convinced... Oh, who are absolutely convinced that they're still alive. Like, yes, you just, you just, I've seen them. I've seen them. Okay, do you have a video of it? I've seen them. You know, my phone wasn't working at the time. We take video of everything. Like, seriously, humans now take videos of everything. 
and suddenly, no, no, I'm telling you, it's alive. Do you have a video of it? Well, you know, the phone. Oh, okay. It's hanging out with Bigfoot. So who have we killed off that's famous? The dodo. Why do we call things uh, dumb, like dumb like a dodo? Because it was a bird that didn't know to fear humans. So we ate them all. That's not an entirely true bit of the story, but we sure helped with that. Uh, Thylacine, I pointed out, mammoth, there's evidence that we killed them off because we hunted them. They already were having a climate change issue going through, but you know we're like, ha, 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 look at us with our little finger, or our little uh, spears, and we pew, 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 and you know, we took them out. This one's the horrible one, the Yangtze River Dolphin. We haven't seen them in a couple of decades, so it's pretty much a guaranteed shot that they're dead. These were known, so obviously in the Yangtze River in China, and they were known to save people who fall over boats. They would swim up, pick them up, and bring them to another boat or bring them to shore, which is why we thanked them with motorized boats and we shredded them to death. Because... We say thank you. So the way that extinctions happen is the population needs to mean something. So when I blabbed on a while ago about what a population was, it's like, oh yeah, it's just the total number, and you know, then we have this exponential growth, and it's amazing, and then uh oh, we ran out of resources, and we have logistic growth. That's actually not true, because a population is not Populations aren't the same, even if they have the same numbers. What turns out to matter are two bits of information. The first one is called the MVP, because everything needs to have an acronym. This is the Minimum Viable Population. Meaning, how many do you need to keep the species going? And it turns out for each species, it's somewhat different. Evidently for humans, a paper that just came out two weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks ago, I didn't understand the paper at all. I tried. I failed. Humans lasted for about, a, for what was it, a thousand years? No, it was longer than a thousand years. A long period of time with an effective population of about a thousand individuals. All of humanity was based upon about a thousand people surviving for a very long chunk of time. So for humans, how many do we need to keep humanity? The answer seems to be about a thousand. Of this population that's needed, one of the things that you have to figure out is what is its effective population. An effective population is the number who can and do we produce. Oh, you have. Five children, that's so sweet. Where are their ages? Oh, they can't reproduce. They don't count in the population. Hit delete. They're not there. Oh, you're a lady person, but you've gone past that, into that stage that no one likes to talk about called the menopause. You're no longer a human. We eliminate you from the population. Oh, you had some type of accident and your testicles actually became sterile, they don't work anymore, yeah, you don't get to count anymore. You had a bad case of syphilis and it actually caused your gonads to heat up to the point where they became inactive. Yeah, you don't get to count anymore. You chose not to have children, then you don't get to count anymore. You're in a same-sex relationship. You don't get to count anymore. We start eliminating individuals from the population. 
when we start talking about extinction and we start talking about population numbers, what we mean is who gets to reproduce. And it's the only thing that suddenly matters. You could have a population of a thousand northern white rhinos. And if all of them turn out to be female, the effective population turns out to be zero because the number of males is zero. They are effectively extinct. So what tends to happen? What we get is this really fun phenomenon, because my job right now is to make you feel good about yourself, called the extinction vortex. So what's the extinction vortex? Something happens to make a population get a little too small. We like their noses or something. Well, this small population triggers some weird genetics phenomena. One of them is you get more inbreeding. When you get more inbreeding, you run the risk of losing genetic variation. You become more homogenized. Well, typically, becoming more homogenized in most environments leads to lower fitness. Lower fitness makes it so it's harder to reproduce. If it's harder to reproduce, your population has to get smaller. But with your population getting smaller, you're more prone for more inbreeding, which is going to make even more of a loss of genetic variability variation, which will make you even less fit, which will make you reproduce even less, which will reduce your population even more. And it continues in this spiral Bloop. until you're done. With the panda? Nah, the pandas are fine. Pandas have their own issues. Namely, they can't figure out how sex works. And the females tend to like sit on the cubs and kill them. Like, but that, that's a different story. They're not good at the whole being alive thing. Like, enough people... Things that tend to be really cute, we're like, we got you. We're out there. We're going to save you. But others, like I pointed out one of them last week to you all. The vaquita? Right? They're the porpoise that's about this big? Like I said, literally, we think it's like seven. We have nothing to fight against that. We have nothing. Northern white rhino, there's two. They're both women. We got nothing. We have had some success fighting back. I don't remember the name of this particular hen, but it's found in the Midwest. And it was a related, so its normal population was decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. And they found a genetic relative, not the same species, but pretty darn close, and they brought it on in just to add some variation. And the result has been a little bit of an increase. Because the adding of genetic variability can recover from that extinction spiral. If you wanted to have one of the best jobs that could exist in a zoo, which is unfortunately not dealing with the platypus because there aren't too many options, but you get to deal with cheetahs. And you're like, I want to have baby cheetahs. I, I would like some baby cheetahs because they're baby cheetahs. And then you have baby cheetahs and they're cute because they're baby cheetahs. You can't sit there and just say that male and that female. Do it. All of the cheetahs are tracked. We know the lineage of every single in or what would be the term? Every single cheetah that's in captivity, we know its genetic lineage. 
and a good chunk of the ones that are in the wild that we've tagged, we also know. And what we do whenever it's time to let the cheetah reproduce, it's literally a database and it's here's the female, she's ready, where are the males? We start finding out the males who are somewhat nearby and we start comparing their genetics. And we try to figure out who is the most distantly related, as in how many generations removed can we get? And if the answer is none of them, let's look at a different country. And cheetah pairings are usually international pairings because they have had such a dramatic loss of biodiversity that we're fighting to build some of it back. But they're all practically relatives, which is not good. We built a building on an anthill. We encroach, and then we, then we complain that, you know, there's ants. Obviously, whenever it's, well, I want to live here, but nature wants to live here, we say, you to the nature, and we kill that off. People who live in the Hollywood Hills, they freak out when they see bobcats and mountain lions. Because, ew, it's going to kill my poodle. No, I spent 30 grand on my poodle. No, you stupid kitty. Bang! Even though the kitty cat was there first. And we said, ooh, I like the view. Whenever we invade an area and different species come into conflict, who always wins? Yeah, he wins. Usually to our detriment. We also like to fragment areas. So we increase something called an edge effect. So an edge effect is something like this. So typically what you would do is if you have this entire zone here, what I can do is I can start to parcel it out. We can add a road. We'll add some cross streets, and then we could start building our neighborhoods on it. I guess we could have another one, like a little bypass, all that fun stuff. What we're doing is we're taking this environment and we're shattering it into smaller chunks. The area is going down. We are also increasing, which is the interesting bit, we're increasing the interaction of this green area with whatever we're bringing it. That interaction of two different areas, two different ecosystems, is called the edge. So edge effects would be we're interacting with the environment or a neighboring environment. Normally, edge effects increase biodiversity because it's where different organisms of different communities can interact with each other. That's the normal pattern. The catch is, with all of our neighborhoods that we're putting on in, how diverse are they going to be? They're going to be all the exact same. So we're bringing in, you know, hegemony into all of this. We are parsing up the land, so we're decreasing the area, which decreases biodiversity. And that decreased biodiversity is now interacting with everything that's the exact same. The result is we get a loss of biodiversity. That's not how it works. Those are the canyons by Malibu. 
all the space that you see here, that'd be the territory of one mountain lion. What'd we do to the territory? There's one divider, there's another divider, there's another divider. Uh, we added some these weird things there. I guess there's another divider there. We immediately start chopping the thing up. And you know that any people down in here, they saw that mountain lion come on through. They're not going to be like, oh, kitty, 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 let's leave kibbles out for you. Like, no. That, of course, would be somewhere in Amazonia. Why clear cut it? Actually, they don't even clear cut it. They just burn it. That's not, not even a true statement to make. But why would you do that? They could have moo cows because they want to have the American diet because we are the best. This is a natural edge. This is a natural version of it. We have whatever's going on in this forest ecosystem. Then we have this plains ecosystem, which is buttressed against what's probably... I don't know if these are going to be future oxbow lakes or if this is some type of wetlands or an estuary. I don't know. But the organisms that live here, the organisms that live here, interact at this border or this edge, and it actually increases the diversity. This is a normal one. Not so normal. Not so normal. Then you have us like adding chemicals. I've already dealt with or told you about eutrophication. Just us adding fertilizer, adding a nutrient that's missing can cause population growth. We can actually visualize some of this from space. All the Mississippi runoff from all the food that we grow in the Midwest and uh, the middle portion of the country all dumps out into Louisiana and they get toxic algal blooms. And with those toxic algal blooms off of the Louisiana coast, they have portions that have less than two uh, milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen, which is basically a no oxygen environment. Things will die if they were to go into that area, hence they're called dead zones. This is because growing food, the exact same food over and over again. Why do we do that? Because we want the same food over and over. Were we ever told don't do that? The answer, of course, is yes. By everyone who is not white, who ever had to do farming, all they've said is you need to rotate crops. You can't keep growing the same bloody thing. And what did we say? I like my food. You probably heard of this book, Silent Spring. Have you all heard of that book, Silent Spring? Have you ever heard of something called DDT? DDT was used to kill off mosquitoes that spread malaria. So we spread DDT everywhere because, you know, screw them mosquitoes, right? The result of that is DDT turns out to weaken the shells of birds so that when a mother lays or sits on the egg, the egg just crushes. And the mother was killing all of the babies or killing all the eggs and the future birds inside, which is why the book is called Silent Spring. The DDT was killing the birds off. Not the parents, the next generation. I've had the pleasure of reading this book. Do not do it. It is horrifyingly dull. And it jumps from topic to topic to topic. And usually it's, holy crap, I don't know what just happened to me. Stop. Let me reorient my brain. Also, because you all are currently in OCHEM, it's going to really freak you out because everything is given its full organic name and then drawings of the structures. 
So if you want to have a little bit of trauma, here's a book for you. Uh, we're finding out that Plastic is doing almost the exact same thing. We have found you know, mothers giving birth in areas nowhere close to America where you take out the... So baby pops out, placenta comes after in the afterbirth. Doctors checking out the placenta. Let's make sure everything's okay. Make some sections of it. Check it out under a microscope. Plastic. In the human placenta. Why? Because clearly the mom was eating plastic. And it made it through her circulatory system and made it through the barriers of the placenta. So how much of it came in, went into the baby? How much of your cells have plastic in them? How much of mine have plastic? I don't know. Maybe DDT was the nicest of the things that we could have been poisoning ourselves with. This here is dealing a little bit with what was going on in Silent Spring. It showcases a phenomenon called biological magnification. Biological magnification is we have low concentrations somewhere at the bottom of a food web or a food chain, but because you have to keep eating more and more and more, it builds up in its concentration as you move up a food chain or a food web. There's a very famous example of this that people have to worry about to this day, especially if you are a pregnant individual. I don't know. Yeah, it's mercury. You have to freak out over mercury. Where are we going to eat that mercury from? Which fish? Not necessarily salmon. No, not salmon. Tuna. The filet mignon of the ocean. Swordfish. Oh. If you've never had swordfish, Oh, you are missing out on one of life's greatest treasures. And you're going to be poisoned by mercury. <laughs> There's another uh, one that's, I don't know how many people eat it, but uh, shark. Shark is very high in mercury. Biological magnification? Sure. So we have the bottom of you know, the trophic level, or the trophic chain. These will absorb the toxin, whatever it is, a little bit. Whatever eats them, because they don't get as much energy transferred, means they need to eat more of these things. So they need to eat a lot more to sustain themselves. Result, they will have a higher concentration of these toxins, because your body's not going to know how to get rid of them. Something eats... You know, this primary consumer. Well, these things need to eat a lot of these primary consumers, which means the buildup increases with them. Thing above them is going to eat a whole bunch of these, which means it builds up in them. In particular, things that usually build up through biological magnification hide in fats. Typically, it's hidden inside fat. Uh, it's just going to make us depressed. Yeah. Uh, climate change is a thing. Are we fighting back? Ish. Uh, we're working on the sustainability thing. Are solar panels sustainable? No. They're not. How do you recycle them? We don't. How do you make them? The big sheet of silicon that we then have to dope. We throw in extra minerals into it to make them work better. Where do we get them? By strip mining Africa. 
that's where we get those minerals from. We are working on other versions that could be recycled and don't involve us needing to, you know, tear apart continents, but they're just not as good. So, like, there's there's issues with this. If you can figure out how to recycle solar panels, yeah, you'll make a lot of money. You'll get yourself at least a Nobel Peace Prize for that one. We can fight back and we can say, you know, NIMBY, not in my backyard. So we get nature reserves. Even though it's still sad when you go to Bolsa Chica and you see all the trash that's still out there. Imagine what it would be like if they didn't have the restrictions. We can try and fix things. The person whose office I'm next to at Long Beach, she works on wetland restoration in the Newport Back Bay. So she is out there every day checking out what's going on with the grasses out there. Y'all know what UNESCO is? These are sites designated by the United Nations as having some type of you know, um, ecological, or they could have some type of cultural significance. They are supposed to be some of the best places that you can visit. California happens to have a few of them. There's one I wish to visit that's found right there. Because of course I do. Perth is a city that's about right here. It's like a 10-hour drive north of there. There's nothing between Perth and there, so good luck. It's where these are found. I want to see these almost more than anything. You know what those are? They're called stromatolites. They only exist in a handful of places in the world. You have the right temperature, the right amount of ocean rocking. It's a rock. No, it's not. It's alive. This is a tower of cyanobacteria. We have found fossilized versions of these. They are something on the order of 4 billion years old. So when we start to talk about, oh, how do you know that life was around that long ago? We found fossils. And you're like, oh, so did you use carbon dating? No, carbon dating stopped after like, 25,000 years. These things only get dated using uranium. Because uranium measures its half-life in the billions of years. How old is Earth? 4.6 billion years. These were practically around at the start of the Earth. But, because of stupid traffic, I'll have to finish this, a little bit of that, that. That's where we will finish up on Thursday. Before you go, you do have some plants you need to check up on. But also, on here, you don't need your names on it. 